Well, good morning. Well, let me, uh, I'm, I'm excited to be here. I'm almost more excited to see the next speaker, the person that's following my, my colleague, because he's got a brand new poll on, on, what, on what youth are thinking, and it's sort of an audit to how well we're doing as, uh, as Americans. I, <clears throat> I've had the same job for about 40 years, and so uh, I've, I've seen an awful lot of surveys and polls. But a good question would be, what, 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 what survey or which poll over all that time was the most profound to you? And I just want to tell you that. Our founder, Dr. George Gallup, loved democracy. He, he, he loved the country. He was an academic from Iowa. And, and he had a very simple mission, and it, and it was, if democracy is about the will of the people, somebody should go find out what that will is. What his concern was is that if leadership is wrong about what the will is, the more they lead, the worse they'll make the country. So they have to be right about that theory. We might even be there right now. He called it the great American dream. He just wanted to know what Americans want. And we've been asking that for 80 years. But here's what you need to know. Starting about 80 years ago, what the great American dream was had to do with freedom, had to do with independence, had to do with praying to the God that they wanted to, and then peace. Wars came along, and then to have a family. And then it changed, and it changed just within the last 10 years. And this is so important. It'll sound subtle when I tell it to you, but it changed, it's, it's probably the biggest sociological change the last 50 years. It changed from peace and independence, praying to the God that you want, to having a good job. The great American dream now is to have a good job. I want to just make a, a couple of points on how that changes things. Here's one it changes. It changes when we get married, or it changes if we get married at all. That changes the whole social fabric of our country. Here's another one. It changes how many kids you have. I don't know about your neighborhood. We used to have, when I, when I was growing up, a lot of kids around. But it changes how many kids we have, or it changes if we have kids at all. So it changes the whole social fabric and the demographics of, the, of a small tribe of people. There's only 300, there's only 300 million of us. It changes everything. But here's one that I think is helpful for today. It changes how you have to lead me because now my job is how I define myself and my relationship, not just with my country, but also with my city, with my friends, with my family, because I am who my job is. It's a brand new demand of people. So you go to young people and you say, how are they doing? The great American dream is stronger and burning brighter with young people than it is with old people. So you say, well, we ought, to be able to, we ought to be able to deliver that. We ought to be able to deliver the great American dream. I want to tell you now how we're doing. There's about 100 million real jobs in America. Now, you'll hear 120 million or 100. They, they add full-time equivalents together, so just stay with me. There's 100 million jobs. So a question is, how many of those 100 million that came to work today, about half of them are young people, are we delivering the great American dream? The answer is 30%. And it's a sample size of about 20 million. It's, it's huge. The error range is like zero. <clears throat> 30 million people came to work in the United States today, about 15 million of them young people, that feel that their job means that they lead a life that matters. They're engaged, they get good ideas, they actually show up, they show up on time, they get more customers. Everything that they do makes the world, makes America and the world work better. But in the middle, we got 50% that are just showing up. Nobody's talking to them, nobody's connecting with them. We got 50% in America that, we, that we've yet to light up. They <laughs> say, well, that's only 80%. What's the other 20%? They're in trouble. 20% are really miserable. 
they're, and they're kind of awful employees, too. I asked one of our analysts, I said, what are we going to call them? Only a Gallup analyst would come up with this, but they said, we call them actively disengaged. <clears throat> yeah. And I said, why, why do we, it's a strange euphemism, but I said, why do we, it's being kind to awful people, but, <clears throat> but I said, why do we call them actively disengaged? And they said, because they're not just miserable in their office, they're going around the halls making everybody else, <laughs> making everybody else miserable too. So it, it's, it's like if, um, if we hear this guy right here says, um, I hear, let's say I work at Gallup and I'm, I'm in my office miserable and, and we say, hey, do you hear what John's doing? He's taking a team of Gallup people down to Mexico and they got a project with the governor and they're going to do this and we're going to make, and that he's going to, we're going to make our numbers for the quarter because he's doing this because every, because John's just that great of a guy and everybody's excited and more people are joining his team and hear that inspiration boiling out of his office but I'm actively miserable, actively disengaged in my office, and I hear that, <laughs> then what I do is I go to his office and sit with him until that inspiration goes away. <laughs> and that's, and that's, and that's, and that's, and that's 20, and that's 20 million people. But, but the point is, is that we've got so much work to do, and especially with young people, I just want to drill down one more time and you say, what did you find that young people want so we can move them from the 20 and the 50% to get more than 30%? This is so important. They want something different than, than, than people my age did when they were young. <clears throat> they want to have a job where they believe that the mission and purpose of the job is important. It's never been that way before. So when you have a young <clears throat> employee You've got to talk to them. doesn't matter if it's Dairy Queen or wherever it is. What are you doing? You're serving customers. You're connecting, making people happy or whatever it is. They've got to know their mission or they'll never get to that 30, they'll never get to that 30 million. They'll never be uh, inspired, inspired, inspired Americans. <clears throat> so you say, well, what about compensation? You can use predictive analytics and you can go through latent class model, meta-analysis, anything you want. You cannot find a connection to pay. Now, this is important. Pay's got to be well done, but it's not a driver of young people like, you, like, like we assume. Here's another one. Latte machines, free lunch, all that, no connection at all. If you ask them this question, do you think that your boss or your manager, you, we don't say boss, cares about you as an individual? And I say yes, and he says no. That's a predictive analytic. You found a needle in that haystack. He and I will have very different outcomes. That relationship is a, is a, is a silver bullet. There's the second and last one is this. <clears throat> Does anyone at that organization care about your development? If I say no and he says yes, he, is a really different, he has a really different life, really different life than I do. But you guys, those two things are so simple. We ought to be able to, we ought to, be able to deliver those. But if we change that 30% to 50% or 60%, this whole economy would come back so fast. You have more ideas, you have more customers, you have more growth. It fixes everything, and it's so doable. I, I, wanted, to give you the, I wanted to give you the most awful statistic I've seen. And... Small business is really important. There's six million businesses in the, in the country. You'll read 26 million are big numbers. 20 million of them are just on paper. Businesses with employees, there's six million of them. 3.8 of them have between one and four employees. They average 1.4 people. Those are classic mom and pop shops. That's 3.8 million. Between five and 10 is one million businesses with employees in it. Between 10 and 20 is 600,000. Between 20 and 100 is 500,000. You could say that there's only about 2 million in that, in that sweet spot. Between, between um, 100 and 500 is only 80,000. See how small these numbers are? And 10,000 or more is only 1,000. But, but that's America Inc. If you add all that up, that's where our jobs are, and that's how we've been able to control the whole world and be 25% of the world's total, total GDP. But this is what's not good. 500,000 businesses start each year that have employees in them. <clears throat> 500,000. 
400,000 fail and drop out. So we ha and that's been running along pretty well for 10 years. It's, it, it goes up and down a little bit, and it, but there's not much trend. And that works. So you have a net of 100,000 new businesses, and that's been, that keeps our economy pumping along. And by the way, our economy is not doing well at all. You know, we're averaging under 2% over, over, trailing, over, over trailing four, over trailing four, four quarters. So those numbers have been going, 500 starts. So if you and I had, had a herd of cattle, we're doing okay because the calves are coming in faster than the cows are dying. We're okay, the herd's growing. This is so important. In 2011, they crossed just like an X. Now 400,000 are starting and 500,000 are dying. But if you wanted to say, and you have to be careful, when the White House talks and Wall Street, remember one's left and one's right, they're both special interest groups. So they, the White House wants us to support them, they want our votes, and Wall Street wants our money. And so they tell us the economy's coming back. When you're with somebody from Wall Street or White House or Washington, ask them, what, ask them to explain that one. We have to have more, we have to have more startups. We just finished some research in Omaha I want to tell you about. <clears throat> we made a test because we're sure that the rare trait of entrepreneurship, starting a business, having rare determination, having the ability to problem solve, and when you get knocked down and it looks like you're never going to win, that you, it actually drives you. We found that it resides in about three in a thousand kids. So there's about 30 million people and in, in kids in middle school and high school right now. And my colleague Brandon's going to show how we're, how we're doing here. But the quick math on that is that there's 100,000 <clears> potential superstars that can absolutely change this country, roaming the hills right now in middle school and, and, in, and, in, um, and in high school. But you see, we could find them. If you have high IQ, we find every one of you because the testing works, and then we treat you very differently. By the way, if you happen to be a good point guard or a great quarterback in this country, we spot you really early, put you in a system. If you have the rare ability to create a customer, a business model, we don't know who you are. We have to fix that institution of thinking, and, and, and that's something that I, think you, I think that you and I can do. I'm trying to speed my remarks up as fast as I can. It, we tested 3,000 kids <clears throat> in Omaha in high school, and we found 5% of them have the unusual traits, and, and I'm sure it's a neuron configuration. 150 kids, but here's, here's what you need to know. Is John Hope Ryan in here? Oh, but John, the, how, can the, how can the poor help us win? IQ um, will, ha favors high, higher income. People don't write it down much, but that's the fact. With entrepreneurship, when God did that one, he was much more egalitarian. It resides evenly with men and women. So we found no significant difference between men and women. The opportunity is huge to put women, to get women into entrepreneurship. So the 100,000 that are roaming the hills right now, half of them are women. No significant difference between blacks or Hispanics. So it means that anytime you see a group of 1,000 kids, now remember, if you have an educational psychologist, they can line them up by IQ, and they'll all agree, and they'll be right, smartest to, but, but then if you say line them up by their ability to create a customer, they can't do that one, and that's the one that we need, uh, that's the one that we need the most. And we can fix it. By the way, I, I, I have this, I have to tell you this story, then I'll introduce my colleague. He's got this great audit of, the, of kids we've surveyed, what they have a bank account and how many want to start a company and all that. But I walked into my apartment, <clears throat> and I'm telling you this story because as, when I'm with executives and they want to change America and all that, if they're not mentoring somebody, I discount everything they say. You're not real. If you yourself aren't mentoring somebody, you are not real. And I can tell you this as Chairman of Gallup, your opinion doesn't count. I don't write it down. <clears throat> <clears throat> but I, I walked into my apartment building, <clears throat> and there was a, <clears throat> a housekeeper that, that takes care of one of the apartments, and she had her boy with it, and I said, who's that? And she didn't have to say anything. He said, I'm AJ, put his hand out. He shook my hand. He's only about that tall. Shook my hand. He just looks me right in the eye, and he says, uh, where do you work? 
I said, I work at Gallup, a place called Gallup. And he goes, <laughs> he, and he had a good firm handshake too. I mean, he, he, you know, sometimes kids will grab the end of it. He grabbed it like that. And <clears throat> where do you work? And I, at Gallup, and he says, what do you do there? And I said, um, I do surveys. I said, we ask people questions. And I said, we write the answers down. We do some analysis. And then we go tell them what we, <laughs> what we learned. And he said, he said, <clears throat> That sounds, yeah, I'm sorry. He says, <clears throat> he says, that sounds like a good job. <laughs> and, and I said, well, I said it is. I, I, I said, um, I love it. And he said, could I work there? And I, and I said, well, I said, yeah, maybe. I said, you'd have to come over and, um, and you have to take an interview and that kind of thing. He put me on the spot. He's, and, and he said, uh, who would I see? <laughs> and... <clears throat> But I didn't want to. I didn't want to lose my own dignity with him. I didn't want to. I wanted him to think I was a big shot. So I said, "Well, you know, you'd have, or should have to see me." <laughs> I haven't hired anybody in ten or twenty years either. But so anyway, he says, oh, uh, "When should I come over?" And I said, "I said, well, come over on Monday." So the only reason I'm telling you this is that this is I met her two people, but this is one of them. But but he he found me. I didn't find him. But anyway, he shows up at, he comes over to Gallup and, <clears throat> and his mom waited downstairs because she wanted him to have to go up and do everything himself. He came into my office and he sits across, and my office is kind of intimidating. You know, it's got all kinds of stuff and all that. He comes walking in and sits down. By the way, his feet don't, he's small, he's, in, he's nine, the man's nine. <laughs> so his feet don't touch and he sits down. And um, so this is the interview and he's looking at me like, you know, if you're such a big shot, let's see what you got. And, uh, <laughs> I said, how much do you know about Gallup? And I've, I've asked people that are 40, 50 years old if they know about Gallup, and they say, well, I don't know too much. Can you tell me? And by the way, those people never get the job. But, <laughs> but anyway, I said, uh, what do you know? And he'd gotten on the Internet, and he said the company was founded by a person named George Gallup in Princeton, and blah, blah, blah. I, it blew me away. So anyway, we, <laughs> we get done, and I shake his hand. I say, you got the job. I don't know what job it was. <laughs> I don't know what job it's going to be. And we did. We set him up with a job, and he works there for uh, summers. And we and um, uh, I take him on calls with me, or take him places. And um, but I think I've learned a lot more from him than he has. We email. He works there during the summer, and then he goes. Uh, he goes goes to school. The only reason I'm telling you this is, it's a lot easier than I ever thought it, uh, it would be, and and it's and it's actually fun. And then you develop a relationship where you have a lot of, we're sitting in the back, and I said, so AJ, I said, where are we now? I said, what are you going to be doing in, in 10 years? And he said, I'm going to be playing in the NBA. And I went, oh, come on, AJ. I said, you can't be. <clears throat> and he says, well, do you think I can't make it? And I said, listen, I said, I love you. No, you have no chance. You will never be in the NBA. <laughs> you know, we're sitting in the back of a, a sedan just driving back from a call. And he went, oh, he goes, good. He goes, I didn't really want to do it anyway. And I said, what, why would you be thinking that? I mean, just I couldn't believe he said it to me. And, and he goes, well, he says, you know, my school, he says, most of the kids are white and I'm black. They just expect me to be in the NBA. And I said, no. I said, tell him not. I said, now. I said, what you do have, a, he's really a talented little guy. But I said, I, I said, you have no chance ever of playing the NBA. I said, but you do have the chance of owning an NBA team. You could do that. And tell your friends that. <clears throat> But anyway, I'll just, this is the last part of the AJ thing. But he, he, one time he called me and said I was going to be a doctor. I said, I'm not excited about that and all that. And he said, I don't, he, I think he thought he was going to hurt my feelings. He says, but I want to talk to you. He says, I'm thinking about starting my own company. And I know exactly what he was thinking. I think he sees what I'm doing and thinking it's so easy. Why would he work for Jim when he can just start his own, po his own, po his own polling company? <clears throat> but... The, the other thing I was going to tell you, there, there was a young guy in Los Angeles, and he was going to start a gang that night. Two of his friends got shot in the head, and he went into high school. He actually showed up the next day, and, but a banker came in and gave a talk, told about what he did. I mean, it's just going over, talking to a high school. The kid raises his hand and says to him, how do you get money legally? The man is 16 years old, 17... The student raises his hand and says, how do you get money legally? Guy told him. That guy started his own 
investment company, started a great big nonprofit, all with just that one moment of showing up and doing something for that high school. You know the guy's name, don't you? John Hope Bryant. But how many times do we miss the opportunity when we could go light a fire with a kid? And, and when you do, just those little mentoring things changes everything. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn the, the podium over to my colleague who's going to show you how well, just how well we are doing and aren't doing with uh, mentoring and financial literacy with America's youth. Thank you very much. Good morning. How's everybody doing? So, uh, so I'm supposed to present data. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to present daggers. Because if you think about the purpose of all this research that Jim has just talked about, it's not about the big data. It's about the needle in the haystack, as he mentioned. We just completed a representative sample of fifth through 12th graders in the US. This is part of a 100-year commitment that Gallup and Operation Hope have made to measure what we essentially describe as the economic energy of youth in the United States. I could share a lot of data with you. I'm just going to focus on the most important insights. Let me just start by giving you the Cliff Notes version of this. There is an enormous amount of economic energy among our youth in the United States. That's the really good news. The problem is there is a huge disconnect between that energy and real opportunities to put it to work. So let me start with some of the good news first, and that is that almost half of fifth through 12th graders in the United States say that they plan to start their own business someday. This is down a little bit from when we began this research in 2011, but it is still a huge percent of our youth saying that they plan to start their own business someday. What's interesting is that if you cut this by demographics, it turns out that non-white youth in the U.S. are much more likely to say they plan to start their own business than white students. This, by the way, is a sea change in just a simple generation where the majority of entrepreneurs today are white and the majority of the entrepreneurial energy among our youth is coming from the non-white population. Just think about all the enormous opportunity we have connected to that. It also turns out that if you ask these young people to evaluate their lives, it's a critical question we ask all over the world from our world poll. We ask Americans every night off of our nightly poll, how do you rate your life? Where do you think it'll be in five years? This is fascinating. If you cut this by their household income, there is no difference in life evaluation. Don't any of us ever think that these young people don't believe that they have a good life today or a good life in the future just because they might not have a high enough household income. There's no statistical difference on life evaluation. What we know is actually something really fascinating that on another point about demographic differences, we actually find that students from the lowest income bracket are much more likely, this is fascinating, they're much more likely to say they get to use their imagination at school and to work on solving real problems in school than kids from middle income families and from wealthier families. That is just a fascinating point. In terms of the opportunities they actually have in schools, right, the opportunity to nurture this entrepreneurial energy, the good news is that we have a decent percentage of kids reporting that their schools offer education about money and banking and education about how to start a business. But on entrepreneurial education, we're down since 2011. We're up slightly since 2011 on learning about uh, money and banking. But it's still barely half of the kids in the United States reporting that their schools provide this opportunity. And when it gets to the brass tax items that I mentioned before, right, super high energy but not connected to real opportunities, very few of them are actually in internships, working in a real business, or have already started 
their own company. And by the way, if you cut this by household income, the kids from the poorer households are less likely to say those things across the board. But if we look at this, right, just if you take the national average, this is cut by income and the three buckets that I have here, there's only about 4.5% of 5th through 12th graders in the United States that are interning in an organization right now. 4.5%. It turns out that kids from lower income households are more likely to learn about money and banking in their school. So we're doing a great job of getting these programs into schools that it's disproportionately, it appears, affecting lower income students. The bad news is that they're half as likely to actually have something real like a bank account. So we have this unbelievable gap between the energy and the real opportunities to put it to work. So if I just summarize this real quick, since we started measuring this in 2011, we are going in the wrong direction on all but one of the key measures we're looking at. Since 2011, fewer kids in the United States are interning, fewer of them say they're currently running their own business, few of them are actually working in a real business, fewer of them have a bank account, and fewer of them say their schools are teaching entrepreneurship. We are going in the wrong direction. But here's the good news. This is an energy opportunity gap. I would much rather face the problem of not being connected to real opportunities than to sit here and look at no energy among our youth for doing this. That's a much tougher problem to fix. The problem that we've identified with this data is an easy problem to fix if we just put ourselves to work on it. And so I would argue that this is not an issue for American schools. As business leaders and organization leaders in the United States, let me just make this point. Schools don't offer internships to students. They don't have jobs necessarily to offer to students. They don't have entrepreneurs running around the halls teaching students. They can't open up bank accounts for students. This is not a school's problem. This is an opportunity for American business leaders to go and change this with schools. So I'll leave you with this point. We should just get off of our ass and go do it. Thank you very much.